So, Lord, we just so thank you for the gift of music, the gift, Lord, of tasting you in worship. And so, Lord, we all say hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We bless and worship you, almighty God. And so, Lord, our souls are already full from just worship alone. And so now, Lord, we open up our hearts to receive seeds from your word. And we agree with you, Lord Jesus, that humans do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. So come to us, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. Worship team, thank you. Let's give the worship team a hand. I just really appreciate that. All right, if you have a Bible, uh, please go to Acts 5. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hands and we'll get you one. Acts chapter 5, we're in verses 1 to 11 as we continue in our series in the book of Acts. And uh, the theme is called the Holy Spirit and your integrity. The Holy Spirit and your integrity. So again, raise your hands if you need a Bible. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. I read an article recently on the 10 biggest lies in history. They included such things as a, a painter from the 20th century in Europe who forged works of art and made millions, but it was all pretending. They were forgeries. Bernie Madoff made the list, as he, as you know, took $50 billion from investors over a period of many years who trusted him with their life savings, but he was pretending to be investing that. Then we had actually Bill Clinton and the Monica Lewinsky scandal made number three on the list <laughs> as he denied his affair with that intern publicly and even under oath that he was pretending. And then Richard Nixon and Watergate made number two. The U.S. president who was involved in wiretapping in the early 1970s of the Democratic headquarters during elections. As he said, I am not a crook. Turns out he was. <laughs> and he resigned. He was pretending. But actually, I added my great uncle Vincent <laughs> to the list. I didn't know Uncle Vincent, but uh, I knew of him. Everyone looked up to Uncle Vincent. He was a doctor, he was very rich. But for decades, decades, he had two sets of families going on at the same time. And the amazing thing was, one was in Brooklyn and the other was in Queens. <laughs> yes. I got to know quite well one of the wives. She had a lot of stories to tell me. But the issue of pretending to be somebody that we're not is so big in our culture that we don't even think twice about it. Everything from airbrushing photos, you know, some of those handsome, hunky men out there and beautiful ladies we see in posters and magazines are airbrushed away, all their flaws. To plastic surgery, to now, as we're into the election season, politicians who will brand themselves and say almost anything to get our votes. To businesses, we know we get used to schemes and sales pitches. I thought my uncle has a, we have a pastry shop, as many of you know, and it was so interesting because there was this fellow that was coming to pick up a $50 cake, and he was pretending to pay. And I watched this whole episode, and I got sidetracked, and he actually was able to walk out without paying. But I realized it was all to pretend. But we pretend in our marriages often. We pretend in our families. We pretend in our relationships. And often what happens, we're one thing in public, and we're another thing in, in private. And uh, so it happens in churches. In fact, I, I, I got, grew so disillusioned with the pretending going on in churches that I, and, and Christian leaders, I, I quit church by 12 or 13. I, I was like, you know, I was done. I mean, some of you are sitting there saying, yeah, I, I don't know if you're pretending too up there. You know, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're looking at me. Is this new life the real deal or what? And uh, you're checking it out. I had a roommate in college, that uh, big guy, and as uh, he moved in, and the, the other of us, we all knew each other. We, we didn't know him. And uh, he's really big, and, and he claimed that he was a Golden Gloves boxing champion from Madison Square Garden. This was in New Jersey, where I was in school. And all year, he would always bring this up, you know, that he was a Golden Glove boxing champion in New York City, and blah, blah, blah. And, well, then one of my roommates got suspicious. 
you know, by the end of the year, because he seemed to bring it up an awful lot. So he went and looked it up in the record books, and it turns out, no, he'd never fought in the Golden Gloves, let alone win. In fact, he'd never even been in New York City, it turns out. <laughs> it was all a pretend. But, you know, you know, you can get to a point where I, I think he actually believed it I, himself. I, you can pretend so long, you actually think it actually happens. And uh, it's, again, it's such a common part of life, I think it's unconscious for, for so many of us. And so what's interesting in this passage we're going to read, this was the first crisis to hit the church. And it was all about pretending. Um, it was a lack of integrity. And uh, again, there's always been a lack of integrity in the world, all through history, and always been pretending. But it was never supposed to be in the church. And that's why God stops everything in Acts 5. The whole movement of the Spirit of God, which is now exploding through Acts. I mean, remember, in Acts, you've got Pentecost, you know, 3,000 dramatically converted to Christ, right? They were speaking in all these other languages and the gospel going all over the empire. And then you got Peter, you know, Peter healing, you know, silver and gold have I none, but, you know, what I do have I give to you, walk, you know, and great miracles. And you have, the, you have the, the, this body life now created from people from all over the empire. And you've got prayer and them, them filled with the Holy Spirit and proclaiming the gospel boldly in Acts chapter 4. And they're testifying with great power to the resurrection of the dead. I mean, this thing is moving. It's, it's incredible power released to the Holy Spirit. Then all of a sudden, boom, it stops in Acts 5. And that's what we're going to pick up right now. So let's read verses 1 to 11. And uh, if you don't have a phone you know, or, or a Bible in front of you, just want to listen, try to picture the scene. And try to imagine this happening here today at New Life. Chapter 5 of Acts. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. After three, about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. How would you like to go to that church? <laughs> so here's the question I want you to ask yourself. How much of your life is divided or involves pretending? How much of your life is divided or involves pretending? And then how much of your life is wearing other people's faces and not your own? So just hold those two questions uh, before you as we go into this text here. And, and um, what's interesting is in, w w the context actually begins at the end of chapter 4 here. Uh, you know, as the Holy Spirit's poured out, there's this great community formed. And one of, one of the fruits of the Spirit of God, you know he's active in your life, is you're no longer so worried and holding on to money as your source of security. And you start giving. You start giving it away to bless and serve other people. So what happens is people are now in the early church, they're actually selling pieces of property and giving it all for the advance of the kingdom uh, to serve the poor and, and what God's doing. And so Barnabas is mentioned here. Some of you know the name Barnabas, a fellow named Barnabas. He, he has sell, sold his field, his house. Let's say in Queens it would be worth $500,000 today. So he sells it, and, and he comes, and he brings it at the apostles' feet, you know, and, and, and they take it. There's great rejoicing. I can just imagine the scene. They're, oh, Barnabas, you know, slapping him on the back. Barney, way to go, you know, and awesome, you know, and everyone's excited, and, and he's, just, he's just popular, and, 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 it's, and he's enjoying the praise of others. And, and so what happens is Ananias and Sapphira see this. And so 
they basically, they sell their field and their house for a couple hundred thousand dollars. And it's interesting, they come and it says they lay it in verse 2 at the apostles' feet. They don't just give it to the apostles. They're going to be really submissive and committed and sold out to God. They're going to get on their knees, you know, and hand and put it at their feet. Sold out for God. But uh, they, it says here they kept back part of it. They, they didn't give, they, they may believe they were giving all of it. They said they were giving all of it, but they didn't. They were just giving a part of it. And so they were lying. They, they were pretending to be something on the outside in front of everybody than what they really were on the inside. And Peter says to them, you didn't have to, hey, you didn't have to do this. I mean, no one's putting a gun in your head. You can just give what you're giving, and that's great. But why did you have to lie? Why did you have to pretend? Why did you have to lack integrity? Why did you put on a show? And then, boom, you know, God's judgment falls on Ananias. And, and he, do, he drops dead on the spot. Could you imagine? I mean, would you stay in the service? <laughs> I run out of this place. And then his wife comes in three hours later in verse 7. I mean, I... She's got the opportunity to come clean. But she doesn't. She lies. She pretends. And boom, she does. And so it says in verse 11, great fear seizes them all, fear of the Lord. You better believe it. <laughs> My goodness. I'm thinking last week, Rick got, Rich got to preach on healing and the power of God and stand up who wants healing. And we're like, yeah, awesome. You know, today I got funerals. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, I got a raw deal today. Today we're carrying people out. Who are pretending. <laughs> I thought about it. You know, you say to someone, someone says, you see someone going outside the church and say, hey, man, I'm praying for you, but you're lying. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, <laughs> so easy to do. And, uh, but, but what's interesting is that the early church does not suppress this story. I mean, if I was writing the history of the early church, I would not have included this story. But they made sure that this story was written down, got a lot of space. And uh, there's a parallel to this story and the book of Joshua. When they came into, if you remember the story, when they got freed from Egypt and they were actually going to conquer the promised land. And God's given them this tremendous life in the promised land. But what happens in the middle of it, in, that, in Joshua chapter 7, there's a guy named Achan. And he lies also about, and the issue has to do about money. And the same thing happens. All of a sudden, there's a, there's a disaster. They start losing all their battles and... And it's, it's, it, the whole thing stops until this issue of integrity and truth is dealt with. It's fascinating. So, so this got recorded, and I agree with most scholars, this is a parallel to the book of Joshua. There is something incredible God is bringing his church into. There's something incredible, friends, God's bringing you into, us into. But the Lord's making a point here about the Holy Spirit is about many things. But one of the critical issues, he's about integrity. That who we are on the outside is who we are on the inside. That we don't pretend like the world does, but in the church, things are authentic. They're real, they're honest, they're, they're genuine. And so uh, I understand how easy it is not to have integrity. I mean, I, I know what it's like to pre pretend. I, I know how it's easy to be one thing on the outside and another on the inside. Or I like to say, it's easy not to be congruent. For example, when I was a kid in elementary school, I had a very difficult time with traditional learning. Sitting in a classroom drove me crazy, especially since most of the teaching was boring. And I remember sitting there in seventh grade, and my mind would be wandering in class, and I'm sitting there, you know, and I, I didn't want them to know that I was daydreaming. So I'm looking, you know, I'm nodding. I'm pretending that I'm listening. And so I was learning even then to pretend. And I remember when my teacher in seventh grade was a sister Catherine, and she'd say, Schizaro, are you paying attention? And since I'm wearing the face, I'd say, yes. <laughs> because I just saw Billy Coviello get a beating. And I'm thinking to myself, I do not want a beating. <laughs> so then, of course, I know what might be happening next. She'd ask me a question. And, of course, I'd fake that, too, hoping I'm in the right subject or the right, at least the right, <laughs> the right country, you know. It's funny, you know. I, so I learned pretending early. Then, then I'd go home to be with my parents. And my parents had many expectations of their children, you know. 
and what, they, what their ideal would be like and what our lives were like. And, and, but I, I didn't want to fulfill any of them. And I remember sitting there at the dinner table thinking to myself a, lo a lot, they have no idea who I am. I'm nodding, I'm participating, and I am living a total double life. And uh, I remember my father had this phrase, if you ever dare do this, I will break your legs. That, that phrase stuck with me well. And so I would pretend, I'd put on a pretend face for years at my home. And then, of course, I got a little bit older, I started to be interested in, in young girls, as a young guy, so I'd put on a face and say, hello. You know? <laughs> and then if they were interested in somebody very intellectual, I would try to be intellectual. You know? If they were interested in someone very suave, I'd try to be suave, it never worked. You know? <laughs> If they wanted, you know, an athlete, I'd try to be very athletic. You know, whatever, whatever you know, just, I'll put the face on whatever is going to help. You know, get me where I got to go. And then you go to work. And, you know, it's funny because we go from school to work. And, and there's still a pressure to be guarded. And what happens is you end up putting up a wall at work. And some of you know exactly what that's like. Uh, and, and we learn this at work. So some of you are teachers and work in the educational system or even police officers. You know, you work for the city. And, and you, you can't even imagine being yourself because they throw you right out. So you, have to, you, put, you, you end up putting a face on and, and a pretend. And then you're in business, the same thing, or maybe social work, or you're a student in school. It goes on. But, but here, here's the, you know, what happens, we end up wearing masks. And, 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 and it's funny, if we did a cultural analysis of which culture pretends more, every culture has pretending in it. We just all do it differently, different angles on it, and some to a greater or lesser extent. But is it, but you see, that's why we should never be surprised that there's pretending in the church. Or there's hypocrisy. Of course. We were, we were reared on it. Do you understand? People are just, it's life. And so no one thinks twice about it. So of course it's pretending. But here's what God's saying in this passage here is, it doesn't belong in the church. That where the Holy Spirit is, he is a spirit of truth. And the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. And we don't wear masks here. Because you, know, you can't build community with masks. Because you don't know who you're talking to. It's a small group of people masked. And it's all a show, and so you can't, there's no power flowing. The Holy Spirit dwells in the church. That's what makes us different than your business, your school. We're hopefully building community and helping in our workplaces and schools to make them better for God. But in this place, friends, in our community, this is not to be a place of masks. The Holy Spirit dwells, and we are an alternative community to the world. There's actually supposed to be integrity here, regardless of the price. Because the Spirit of God has done a work in us, and he's moving in power. And unless there's integrity, what this passage is saying is, there is no flow of power. That's how big this thing is. And so, uh, Peter realized this wasn't just that Ananias and Sapphira had a little character flaw that they picked up from their parents. I mean, he didn't say, no, Ananias, you shouldn't lie. Now, listen, did you really give it all? No. I mean, he, he begins to say things like, verse 3, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 3, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? The same word used for Judas. Peter realizes there is a huge spiritual battle raging over the issue of integrity. It's not a little one. And uh, he sees the violation of integrity and this pretending as an invasion of satanic powers. We're unconscious. We're so used to it. He says, no, this is life and death. And so God comes in, I mean, my goodness, he comes in great power. But if you're going to be a community of the Spirit, that means we've got to have the ability to recognize this is the powers of darkness, and it doesn't belong here. So he connects the pretending and a divided self with spiritual warfare. I think it's amazing he does this in this passage. And, and so, okay, so, so try to imagine what would have happened in Acts if God did not intervene. Imagine. So they just kind of go on, Ananias and Sapphira become leaders in the church, you know, maybe put a plaque up for them, you know, for having given all that money. And, you know, then other people start pretending to. And it's a whole big, that's it, that's the church. We probably would not be sitting here today because there cannot be a movement, expansion, and a power of the kingdom. It's all a shell. It's all tragic. We lose our integrity very slowly. There was a famous movie, this issue of losing our integrity slowly or slipping into pretend or, or we end up over time very slowly becoming somebody we're not. There was, a, there was a, uh, uh, an episode that happened, a true story that happened in the 1950s uh, around the t NBC TV show called 21. And there's a movie made of, by Robert Redford called Quiz Show. It's worth watching. It's a true story about a guy named Charles Van Doren. And uh, he was about 30 years old when he first got on the program. That's him to the right. And he, he, his father was a 
famous Pulitzer Prize winning poet. Uh, his father taught at Columbia University and he was an instructor at Columbia University in English. And so what happened was the show 21, it, it was the most popular show in the 50s. Um, they were always trying to get the ratings up, right? And so it was kind of like Jeopardy today. They would ask you questions like, you know, what was the name of Paul Revere's horse? You know, things like that. Or, you know, who won the, who won the best Academy Award, best picture of Academy Awards in 1932? Obscure trivia like that. And, uh, but what happened was that they, they, they would say that, that the questions were put in a vault of a bank and they would kind of film the, the them coming in the armored truck with the question. But the truth was the NBC producers were giving the answers to people. And they were making sure different folks would win at certain times to keep the ratings up, to make it very exciting. And so they got this guy, Charles Van Doren. They said he's, he's young, he was 30 years old, he was single, he was handsome, and they made him the winner. And he agreed to, take, he agreed to do it because they convinced him that, oh, if you do this, first you'll make a lot of money. But secondly, uh, you'll also cause kids out there to love education. And that's why you became a teacher, isn't it? And it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you kind of justify it. His salary was $4,400 a year as a professor at Columbia. He made in 14 weeks $138,000. So he was, on the, he was on the front cover of Time magazine. He was getting 500 letters a week. Every woman in America wanted to marry him, at least single. And, uh, you know, his classes, it's, you can imagine his classes at Columbia were packed with women, of course, you know. And so he, he loved it. He was just like having a tremendous life here. But then somebody, one of the ex-contestants got bitter and, and it began to come out that this thing was fixed. And he's denying it. He denies it to his lawyers. He denies it in front of a grand jury. Uh, and, uh, but basically, to make a long story short, he's so, he's so like in this pretend thing, he, he calls a press conference. He's one of the most famous people in America. And he says, yeah? He goes, I'll appear in front of a House committee that's investigating that this is a scandal out in Washington. Well, the committee called his bluff and said, come on down to Washington. Put him under oath, and he had to come clean. And here's what he said. Van Doren finally confessed, quote, I was involved, deeply involved in a deception. I have deceived my friends, and I had millions of them. I was scared, scared to death. I've been playing a role all of my life. I've been playing a role all my life, and it crashed. What was shocking was the guy who, who kind of who snitched on him and got the whole scandal going was from Queens. <laughs> he broke the scandal. And he was like, you know, he was a working class guy, but apparently had a lot of trivia in his head. But it turns out he also got the answers. He didn't tell anybody, though. Came out later as well. In fact, every contestant who won was all get. everybody was getting the answers. Even his own wife and family didn't even know he was lying. But what I'm saying is that, that, that there's so much entanglement of pretending that I recognize when we think about your life and families and workplaces and neighborhoods, we're so entangled. You say, how could I possibly get free from this thing? How, how can you live differently? No, Thomas Burton's got a great, great quote from New Seeds. It goes like this. He goes, trees and animals have no problem. God makes them what they are without consulting them, and they are perfectly satisfied. It's nice, isn't it? With us, it is different. God leaves us free to be whatever we like. We can be ourselves or not, as we please. We are at liberty to be real or to be unreal. We may wear one mask and now another and never, if we so desire, appear with our own true face. So that's my question. What face do you generally wear? And, and you see, I, there's been many ways people have tried to get at this over, over church history. Like, like there's a pretend self that often we wear out to the world, but inside of you and me, there's a, there's a solid self or a true self in Christ. It's, it's you. It's the Holy Spirit in you that you were created from the foundation of the world. There's nobody like you. You're unrepeatable. We love that word, Jerry and I. Unrepeatability of the human person. There is nobody like you on the earth. And you, there, inside of you is a true you. You're, you're that unique snowflake. And, and there's a unique expression of you. If you'll have the courage to come out. But that requires a process of getting off of you all the pretend self that may have been put on you from culture, friends, people, church, you name it. And becoming you. So the question is, how do we get there? How, how, so I, how do I, we're going to pray at the end of the service, but I do think it's a slow discipleship process. For whatever reason, Ananias and Sapphira did not go through this process. They were just, they just, whatever they were doing in the world, they just brought it right in church. Now they're pretending here too. And God said, no, not here. Not here. So here's the three things I want to, I'll close with very briefly here. Uh, three things, space, suffering, and uh, safe community. 
Those three things. Let me unpack this a little bit. Space. I'm talking about space to allow God to reveal our true selves. It's space to, to allow God to reveal your true self. Rushing and lying are closely connected. When we're rushing through life, packed with activities in our minds, it's very difficult to not be pretending. Because there's no space to actually let the Holy Spirit begin to uncover and reveal to you truth versus what's not true. Remember, God, the Holy Spirit's outside of us. I mean, God dwells in the universe, but the Holy Spirit's inside of us. God lives inside of you. Christ has taken away the sins of the world. And we need silence to be able to hear him, to get those layers off us and those other faces. There's a, there's a time to unplug from all of your roles and to basically uh, listen deeply to the God inside of us. So, you know, think about laying aside your role in life. We have a lot of roles that we play, right? Some of us are your bankers, or you're a stockbroker, you're a mom or a dad, you're a teacher, you're a nurse, you're a real estate agent, a business owner, uh, you're a truck driver maybe, or a doctor, grad student or high school student, or might a pastor. But, but lay aside the role of all the expectations that go with those roles. But, but who are you? Underneath that role. So there's a great poem, which I'm going to only read a part of the poem here. Uh, and it's by Mae Sarton. Some of you may know her. But, uh, so forgive me for not putting the whole poem up there. It would be too long. I mean, just doing a poem in a sermon is risky enough, all right? But poems have a way of getting at things that sometimes prose doesn't. And this is a section of a poem. I just love it. It's called Now I Become Myself. And, and it reads as follows. Uh, now I become myself, it's taken time, many years and places. I want you to catch that. Now I become myself, it's taken time, many years and places. I have been dissolved and shaken, worn other people's faces, run madly. Hurry, you'll be dead before. I'll stop right there for a second before I read any further. I love the fact that it's many years and places. And that dissolved and shaken up because we wear many people's faces for a long period of time. In some, way, in some ways, it's normal and healthy as a young person growing up. I can, I can borrow some to be influenced, but when I actually wear them, now we have a problem. They, their face becomes my face. It's not mine any longer. And so we run madly around life, hurrying around, frantic, trying to, in a sense, find ourselves. And then it goes next. Now to stand still, to be here, to feel my own weight and density. I love that phrase. Just the solidness of you. You don't need someone else to, to shore you up. you got a sense of centeredness in God. My, now I feel my own weight and density in this single hour I live. All of myself and do not move. I, the pursued who madly ran, stand still, stand still, and stop the sun. That comes out of the book of Joshua. You know, the sun and stop. When we stand still, we get our weightiness and that, see, nobody can do that inner work for you. Nobody can do it for me. I can't make you stop and create space to allow the Holy Spirit to do a deep work in your interior life. So for me, I know it involves things like I've got to keep myself centered. So I've got to avoid certain things like too much media, too many movies or television, too much stuff crowding my brain uh, or worries. I, I I need silence. That's why we're constantly pumping the contemplative here. We know if you're going to become the person God's called you to be, somehow, some way, you've got to figure out some rhythms of silence. We talk about Sabbath keeping, offices, rules of life. I don't know. I, I know retreats, whatever you need. They go on retreats. I mean, I, I went on a retreat, as many of you know, three weeks ago or two weeks ago. I can't imagine not having gone. I, I, every time I go away, it was a three-day chunk because I said layers were coming off of me because it's a lifetime process. I'm like, oh, my gosh. But when you get to that level of silence... For a period of time around God, things begin to become clear. And, uh, but it, it's difficult to be still, to create the space, because there's nothing in the culture creating space. But we are different than everybody else because of Christ. But it's not just that. It, 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 there's also suffering. And I don't have time to say a lot about this. I, I like in the poem, she actually brings up the issue of suffering. Uh, but I, Richard War said it well. He says, I don't know anybody who becomes their true self without great suffering. And as I heard that, I said to myself, that is true. The suffering comes, I think, in two forms. I think part of it is 
Internally, it's very hard to confront one's own hypocrisy. It's very hard to confront the fact that I sometimes I'm not living what I'm speaking. And to have this, create the, the space for that deep inner work. It's a death, no question about it. To let the Holy Spirit in those places. What would it have cost Ananias and Sapphira to be able to, to not be jealous of Barnabas? They were probably jealous of all his popularity and all that. And be happy for Barnabas. You follow me? Barnabas has a different calling in his life. And, but to go there, be part of the community, take their spot, and be authentic. Yeah, you know, I'm giving whatever, $50, and that's it. But I'm, I'm happy. I'm, but not pretending, just being themselves. But it would have cost clearly some work internally. But then there's external work, too. I mean, it's external suffering. I, uh, friends, th- th- some of us, we don't, I, I, we're afraid. We'll say, if I, if I became myself, if I was myself, Pete, there would be people mad at me. Yeah. Uh, I would be misunderstood. Maybe. I would lose some money, perhaps, but at least you'll have your soul. If you think you're late, so I'm so late, I'm in my 50s or 60s or 70s, I'm still coming to my true self. No, no, no. Friends, it takes time. This is a lifetime journey. But there's a third factor, and it's called this. You need safe community to come out. Uh, we have this phrase here in our, in our rule, our little monastic rule at New Life. It's called alone together. And if you're around New Life for a long period of time, if you go to the spiritual formation retreat in a couple of weeks, you'll experience being alone together. But uh, what that means is uh, we want you to be who God called you to be. But you also need to be around some safe people. You, you can't do this alone. It takes a community because the world, it's so far from the world out there. Parker Palmer likes to use the illustration. Is we're like, we're like um, our true self is like a wild animal in the woods. We've, we've been so beat up and chased down that we're hiding and we're afraid to come out. Because if I really come out and you find out who I am, you're going you're gonna to reject me. And so I stay in hiding behind the bushes. And so what we need is a community in a healthy place where we're saying, come on out. You can be yourself and we'll still love you. You can be whoever God's called you to be and we still accept you. But to create that kind of environment where I'm not trying to fix you, save you, advise you, make you like me, friends, that takes a lot of maturity. That, friends, is ideally what we want to be at New Life Fellowship. We want, if you're a parent, you want your children not to be what you want. You want them to be what God created them to be. But how much more of a church, we want transformation to be, that we become our true selves in Christ with integrity, with the same on the outside as the inside, and that's the great gift we give the world. But we are much like, you know, a, a bird in a hand. You know, our, your, 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 your person is like that little bird. Now, that little bird of handle improperly, you can crush it. And some of you have been wounded here in this room. You've been crushed. You've been beat up, and you're sitting here saying, I don't trust anybody. you got your walls up, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep talking, Pastor Pete, you know. <laughs> but you, but you, can, you can take the feathers off that bird, right? Some of you know what that's like. Some of you have been dropped. You thought these people were actually caring for your true self, and they dropped you. But do you realize God made you? That inside of you is the beautiful image of God. And now the Holy Spirit's in there to free you from living a double life. And free me, that we might actually walk with integrity. And so, ideally, we talk about being a safe community. Our goal is that we actually launch each other. That you fly. You were meant to fly. There's no life like yours anywhere. And that in those hands of God and hopefully of good, healthy people, you're invited to go and fly. Let me close with a little story here. And it's a story of a, of a, it's a true story of a fellow in our small group. His name is Wen Wei. And he was here first service. I wish he was here second. I'd have him stand up. He's a doctor. And uh, he works with cancer patients. And uh, Wen Wei, I think, had the experience of being in a safe community. And so he's come out. I've watched him over the year. And he's like a different person now than when we first met him. And he knows it. And so he tells me that when he goes and sees a patient, you have 10 to 15 minutes because of the way things are structured financially for a, a hospital. And a patient gets to talk up to 17 seconds, but then you're expected to interrupt that patient and break in so you can get moving. You've got to get out of there for the next patient. And uh, so he's now with a patient of his who's 75 years old, a big guy. Now, I want you to understand, Wen Wei is originally from Laos. Uh, he's Chinese, so he's thin and, you know, short. The 75-year-old man is African-American, Native American, and he's really big. Okay, so you've got, you got, you got to get the contrast here, the two people. So this 75-year-old man, his patient, uh, is, uh, only has one to two years to live. Okay? And Wen Wei could see the guy was lonely. 
and was, was longing to be comforted. And so, Win Wei, he doesn't do the 17-second rule of shutting them off. And he doesn't do the 10 to 15-minute rule. I mean, he's just kind of like expanding the time out. And so he says to the guy, the 75-year-old man, he says, may I hug you? Now, you don't do that. I haven't gotten a hug from a doctor. I don't know. You know. <laughs> Maybe some of you doctors can hug me on the way out. But he says, may I hug you? And, and, and he says, he said, he goes, I, I felt like this was part of his healing process. And even though it's rarely done. And so he, he hugs the man, you know, and they embrace. And that's the end of the visit. Four weeks later, the man's daughter comes in. And uh, she's tough. And uh, she doesn't trust Wen Wei. And she's got a lot of hard questions for him, you know. It's going on like that. And so he explains the medical plan, etc. And then and as he explains it, the 75-year-old the, the father says, no more chemotherapy. No more. And so Win Wei had learned one of our skills, the community temperature reading. And some of you know what that skill is. And so he says, okay. Uh, he says, Win Wei says, hey, may I ask you a question? So he says to the 75-year-old man, what are your hopes and wishes? And then the man says, I want you to hug me again. <laughs> and give me your spirit. Which comes out of a whole Native American tradition. And so Win Wei says, this is what I'm going to do. He goes, we're going to put our chairs together. He kind of puts some chairs face to face. He goes, I'm going to hold your hand, and you're going to hold mine. We're going to, we're going to grasp hands. And I want you to close your eyes, and I'm just going to be with you. And, it, uh, and he goes, I'm not, we're not going to unlock our hands until you're ready. And so they hold hands, and um, they kind of lean back. And, it, you know, it's about 30, 40 seconds it ends. And then Win Wei asks him, are you getting any physical touch at home? And the man says, no. And they, they, then he looks at the daughter. And he says, there's a lot of healing in touch. I want to encourage you to go home and touch him more. And that was it. It's a beautiful story. But because what he was doing one way was he was connecting his role as a doctor with his soul, with how God made him. He's a very warm, affectionate, touchy guy. You're with him, you just feel love coming out of him. But he was able to get beyond the prescribed role from the hospital administration of what he should be doing and let God come through him to be something that was wonderful. What would it look like for you to get beyond your role expectations of other people and, and authorities and actually be yourself in that role? How different might your life be if you weren't pretending to be something on the outside that you weren't on the inside? And what Acts 5 teaches us is you need the Holy Spirit to become that kind of person. This is one of the core issues of the journey of the whole Christian life. Wow. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. You know, the, 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 the thing ends, verse 11 says, great fear sees the whole church. Uh, wow, the fear of the Lord. And I, you know, judge, swift and sudden judgment for one sin. You know, could you imagine if God killed us every time we pretended? We, none of us would leave here alive. <laughs> but the Bible does say the sin that, the soul that sins shall die from Ezekiel. And it's true that you really can't understand God's mercy until you understand his holiness. And as R.C. Sproul says, we are so amazed at God's justice in this passage, we should be even more amazed at his grace, that we're all alive in this room by his grace and his mercy. Because all the judgment that's due for our sins was poured out on Jesus on that cross. And here we stand here by the grace and the mercy of God we're alive. And we stand before God not based on our performance, but based on Christ. And so he wants to bring us to a place, though, of freedom. He died to free you, okay, from that layer. So I'm going to invite you all to stand with me. Because to be truthful to yourself has to flow from a deep place of integrity in your interior life. And I just want to invite, I want to just, you know, Rich had to stand and pray last week for healing. Uh, I want to pray for you for wholeness. The Holy Spirit's about making you whole, not divided, that you're the same inside and out, genuine yourself. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. Just re just, I just receive right now power from the Holy Spirit himself. Yes, there's space needed. There's suffering involved. There's place for safe community. 
But there's a place, friends, for the power of the Holy Spirit to fall on us. To make you, to make me, to make us a church like the world's never known before. That's, that's truly the walls have come down. And people walk in and get in touch with you and, and, and us and just say, what is this about? And it's the Holy Spirit flowing freely in our midst. So we need the power to sustain us on the journey. Just receive right now power. And so, Lord, let, your, let, let the power of the Holy Spirit fall in this place, Lord. I think of every teenager here in this room and young person, Lord, all ages. And Lord, Lord, I pray like a mighty river, you'd, you'd move through us, Lord, and begin to pull out of us, Lord, the walls that we've put up out of fear. And you might tumble them down, Lord, that, that we might experience the kind of freedom and the joy that comes out of living the life that you've uniquely crafted each of us to live. And Lord, I pray you might free us from the opinions of others, that we might have the courage, Lord, that you might grant us the courage to live this kind of a life that we've only dreamed about living. And that we might come alive, the seeds you've placed in us, in such a way that each life in this room would be a gift as we leave here. And so I bless you all in the name of Jesus. Receive his power, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we've got some prayer teams to your left, and uh, we've got the Lord's table to your right. And I want to invite you to come, and, and I mean, obviously the, the place of freedom and liberty is communion with Jesus. So the Lord's Supper is here to your right, we invite you to take of it. Uh, and gonna, we, listen, I, we had a great prayer time, first service, and I invite you to come. Uh, you know who you are. You've got some enormous walls up of pretending going on, uh, some of your own doing very consciously, others of you unconscious. I want to invite you to come and let God free you, because it is true that where there is the spirit of the Lord in prayer, there is liberty, my friends. So you come because God loves you. He, came, he brought you here. He's setting you free to take you somewhere for his sake. So you come. Our prayer teams will be here. All right, so I invite you to just open your hands up towards heaven if you'd like. And I want to receive a blessing as we close. That's because God looks at you and he sees, he sees you, the real you. Not a fake you, but the real one. And he looks at the real you and he loves you and delights in you. And he speaks blessing over you. And he's calling you forward by grace and love. Just take a deep breath and receive his love for you. So may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you close to his heart. And may the Lord make his face shine over you. And may the shining of his face and his love and his power may just flow right through you. And may it dissolve all the other faces that you're wearing. And may your true beautiful face come forth. May he melt your fears. May he bring down those walls. And may he give you from heaven itself courage. Courage to get up and be the woman, the man that he's invited you and called you to be. So go forth from this place and, and be the gift you were made to be to those around you. And I pray this over you in Christ's name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a great day.